Lisa. Yes, baby girl. When I grow up, I want to be a woman to society. And so shall you be. Hey, this is Lisa Landry. Welcome to Woman is to Society. And I hope you'll please welcome with me Kenneth Ray Stubbs, PhD, shaman, certified sex instructor, and masseur. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Now, you've authored 10 books, and I noticed that your sex guides have sold more than a half million copies. Actually, that's one particular one, the erotic massage, the touch of love and sold almost a million copies. I self-published it. Uh, and there was no book out there at the time that uh, illustrated the male and female genital massage. There were massage books. Some massage books talked about genital massage, but no one illustrated it. That's very impressive. And I'm very thankful that the society opened up because I think it's very important to acknowledge the genitals like any other part of the body. These were all in very good taste because you have to realize this is back in 1986. And now it's like, I don't know how many books out there with the concept of erotic massage and, and illustrations and photography and just, you know, it's very, very common now, but it was cutting new ground uh, back in the uh, late 80s. Right, well you were, you were breaking new ground coming out with something that had probably been pretty taboo before. Yeah. You decided exactly. to do this. And what was your inspiration for putting that book together? Back then, pretty much the only thing we had around 1966 was Mathis and Johnson, where they observed with instrumentation the, the event of orgasm and came up with a definition of orgasm. We didn't have sexology in 101 classes before that. When I was in grad school in the summer, I, I was an intern for Planned Parenthood, so I got, had an opportunity to read a lot more and film clips uh, and all that. So I had a little bit of a, a education in sexuality, human sexuality, uh, from an academic point of view or informational point of view, rather than from a porn point of view. Eventually, when I did my hippie trip and ended up in San Francisco, I went to massage school in 1973. And I went out there and started doing massage in the world and both teach a short-term classes. I really felt that the massage profession was in denial around sexuality uh, because the, the genitals were very taboo and the anus. Uh, the massage school I had gone to did include breasts, but that was pretty avant-garde, but that was San Francisco in 1973. <laughs> what a time to be alive, huh? Yeah, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> there was a, a wonderful opportunity there, and I jumped. Uh, this was uh, all pre-AIDS and everything, so that, uh, you know, we just, you just stepped in and, tried everything, and fortunately I survived, <laughs> um, and uh, some people did not, but yeah. because a lot of things were new, we didn't understand, and we had to become much more educated. Anyway, uh, I felt that the massage profession was in our own sexuality, and uh, I knew that when people went to massage seminars, that once they got home, and they were with a lover, that they were going to be applying that massage to uh, exploring it with their uh, lover's genitals as well. Uh, and so I thought, well, why don't we just teach a class and how to really include this. So I put together a class and called Erotic Massage. And at the time, the term of choice was sensual massage. And that would imply including the genitals. And I, I said, let's, let's be more explicit here because sensual massage, in my mind, did not necessarily imply that, but erotic massage would more likely. So I started teaching, uh, um, I think, in 19... 19 and 75, 1976, <laughs> erotic massage classes, and he went very, very well. It was open to people of all sexual orientations. However, I found even in avant-garde San Francisco, uh, it was very hard to get the gay and lesbian couples coming to a general seminar. So eventually I did a specific gay male erotic massage courses and uh, did a few for women, but everybody was welcome to come to all of them all the time, and it was always for twosomes. And it included the genitals, but also included uh, foot bathing, feathers, and ferments. It was mainly massage, but it was a general pleasuring. It's about looking at the whole body as a pleasure zone, rather than two or three or four or five different places. It's always in the magazines you talk about the erogenous zones. So I, my perspective is that the whole body, if you become aware, and if 
you're open to it, it, it in a sense, it's a whole arises in its own. So eventually, then I wrote a, a manual on that, and that went nowhere. Because uh, I wrote it for all anatomy types. We were starting to consider then uh, what was called, well, now it's called transgender at the time, of, uh, transsexual. But that term has become out of, not so popular now. Yeah, it's uh, transitioned. <laughs> the politics of language around sexuality is pretty narrow, but it sets how people are. You know, I have a background in sociology, and so people get caught up in, you know, it's called this, it's called that, when it's just not really important. People get caught up in labels, you're right. We get caught up in labels. Yeah. Uh, and so that book went nowhere, uh, even with my liberal friends. So over the years, I eventually wrote books for male-female couples, male partners, and female partners. So I have a series of books, as well as a uh, DVD on the whole body that included the, uh, the genitals as a part of the process. That's sort of the evolution, because it, like, it was not being done. I thought it, it should be done. Uh, it was important to acknowledge the whole body rather than down there bullshit. Of course, you can say down there if you want. <laughs> but, but, but at the time... It was sort of like, ooh, down there, the dirty stuff. Eh. I don't know what your age is. There's been a lot of openings since the flat-top fascist 50s I grew up in around sexuality. And now it's pretty much taken for granted. Well, I can't say it's taken for granted, it's just not understood. Uh, given that I'm 73 and I was back there in the <laughs> really bullshit days. How repressed was it? Unbelievable. And the mid-60s, we came out with the birth control pill. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after, around, you know, around that time also, the uh, hallucinogens kicked into the, uh, in the hippie scene. Um, and it just opened up the wall, uh, and I'm not advocating using hallucinogens at all, so, but it did. Are you at least offering? <laughs> Actually, uh, as a focused meditator uh, and energetic developer, I recommend not, not using uh, yeah. nature plant. Well, let's put it this way. I know some people who run down to Amazon. Uh, they did seven ayahuasca journeys in about 11 days. And I suspect that's really, really unwise. And so what's happening, if you want to develop sh really shamanically, you need to be in, the, in that culture uh, from which these ceremonies come, but be there the whole year to all the different ceremonies so that there is a context and we don't have much of a context here in our contemporary world uh we you know go down to the amazon and uh, and do uh, ayahuasca and come back mm -hmm. well it's like you know if you watch the, the hopi world uh, they have their ceremony season doing all sorts of things for months after months and people are planning for it uh, for the sun dance ceremony that I was involved in, in when I was a shamanic apprentice. It would last for a year for me. I would, uh, around the uh, winter solstice, I started in my mind thinking about what's going to be on my shield, what uh, symbols going to be on my shield for the Sundance ceremony, which usually took place around the uh, solstice time in the summer. Then I would uh, come back, I'd have the shield painted, because I'm quadruplegic, so I couldn't paint myself, and come back and put it on my altar, on my mesa, uh, and observe it for six months, you know, in, the back, in my peripheral vision, seeing it. So it became a ceremony that lasted for a whole year. Wow. Your ceremonies are a focus for a period of time rather than just go uh, spend one weekend, and uh, and that's good. It opens up the, you can open up the doors of perception, I have found, but they, so I would recommend if you're going to do any sort of teacher plants that... Uh, that, it, that they be natural rather than as synthetic as possible. And it can be a meaningful experience. It's just that after a while, of, back in the hippie days, of synthetic uh, and some natural, I began to realize, you know, I'm getting tired of having to drop a pill to go to this consciousness, this awareness. And uh, I realized I need to put my ass in a meditation mat mm -hmm. or some variation on that. And that's what led them to uh, much more Tibetan Buddhist meditation, uh, as well as uh, being on a shamanic path. So I know we moved away from sexuality here, but uh, it's all about energy. Yeah. You recommend meditation over, like, ayahuasca tourism? Because I would think that'd be a better plan myself. I, I'm, I'm in agreement. <laughs> we grow however we grow. We go do something and say, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. And 
learn from it. Or we go and learn, and that was valuable. To really deepen, to grow, whether it be shamanically, spiritually, or however it's you want, uh, it means an ongoing thing. It's like a meditation practice, uh, where, you, where you do it uh, on a, pretty much of a daily basis. Uh, when we approach sexuality in a uh, ceremonial way, uh, with awareness, it is very important. Uh, and I can go into that in terms of the energetic point of view. Was oh yeah, sure. I think of it like a what we are is a being embodied in an organism. And that being has consciousness. Uh, it includes all the things that people call chakras and a whole lot more. The incarnation process we embody with this particular organism, uh, and in order to develop ourselves. Um, and the sexuality is, in, is an essential part of our embodiment because one, it continues the species, uh, but also it is a way to get more energy. In fact, there are only two ways to really get more energy into the being. I'm not talking about eating carbohydrates uh, for the organism now. I'm talking about for the being, to get energy. And that is, one is orgasm, and I see, I think, of four different types of orgasm, some of which are like mystical experiences, other than what people think of orgasm. But orgasm, to me, technical definition is manifesting more elemental energy or more chi in the process. Somehow, in the process of doing something such as a sexual orgasm, we literally bring in what's already within us more, what I would call, energy. And that Energy is what's used to develop these energetic structures, which enables us to develop spiritually. I mean that very, very literally. Having to, to be dependent upon the priest or priestess or the pope to be absolved of your sins and, and all that stuff, um, because these religions that focus on that seem to focus on controlling your, your sexuality as well. Yeah, they really do. That kind of seems to be a theme. To be more one with God, you would commune with God, source, goddess, whatever term you want to use, uh, which is non-gender specific in my point of view. Um, Amen. We need to develop certain energetic structures, uh, which everybody has. But the Dalai Lama has simply done what most people have not done. Inherent in nature, are certain energetic structures that can be developed. Um, and the difference between the Dalai Lama and most people is he's developed them over many lifetimes. And it's not just simply, oh, you sit down and meditate and you develop them. It, it's much more involved and extensive than that. But the, to develop these energetic structures, you need more energy. Not carbohydrates, but more energy. I mean, bringing in literally more energy energy for us to develop ourselves. And that energy comes in via orgasm. That's the most common way it is available. Um, but, I was, but I can go into four different types of orgasm if you want. You know. Sure. There is a second way, uh, which I've just come to understand in the development of what uh, in Tibetan Buddhism is called the rainbow body. Where you have direct access to the, uh, you might say, primordial energy, or what I would call light, which I define as the, um, as the undifferentiated primordial essence of existence. Where and this, this undifferentiated, so that everything is everything is everything. So this is where everything originates. If we ac can access that, we can, in a sense, eventually uh, uh, access uh, unlimited energy. Um, so, but that's really much higher down the line before you, uh, uh, when we develop the uh, rainbow body, but I've only in the last year we come to have that understanding. But the point is that the most accessible way for people is to have a sexual orgasm. That's how we get more energy uh, for our being. Again, not the carbohydrates for the organism. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other types. And for those people who wanted to touch uh, and kudoshka, uh, it's a lot of focus on what I would call the light body. Um, and rather than the physical body, uh, and people are doing various breathing exercises, but various meditations, um, 
uh, and you have other types of orgasms, which in the case of the male, uh, uh, what a lot was, was really popular a few years ago, well, 20 years ago maybe, uh, about the multiple orgasms for men. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if that was a real thing. Well, that's a real thing, but it's not a sexual orgasm. It may, be, may feel sexual, but it, it, it's a different energetic structure. First of all, orgasm um, is different than ejaculation. It's the organism that has ejaculation, and therefore, when men have an ejaculation, they will never fall asleep because the body says, uh, pri you know, primary objective here is continuation of the species, and that means we've shot our wad, and we need more sperm, you know. So roll over and fall asleep and get that done. You say, well, yeah, you got uh, what is that? What does energy go? Well, that's a different type of energy. You still have to um, deal with the uh, reproduction of more sperm, uh, and that's a biological process. And maybe give a few cuddles. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, yes, it's, <laughs> it's a possibility. But the point is, it's a real tendency for a lot of males to roll and fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> so I've been told. If you learn to have what I call light body orgasms, you usually don't ejaculate, although you could. And you can just have one orgasm after another, after another, after another. And it appears to be similar to female orgasms. These are real orgasms being very explosive and they can occur uh, in the pelvic area, the abdominal area, the chest area, or the, the whole being. Uh, when people talk about full body orgasms, it's possible for all four types of orgasms to be combined. Mm -hmm. So, physical body orgasm, light body orgasm, a third type which I would call a spirit body orgasm, and this is very, very subtle, very subtle. It's sort of like when you go to the county fair and you eat cotton candy. Well, you don't munch into it like you do a I'm a joy bar. Cotton candy is melting in your mouth. It's like a nectar. Uh, spirit body orgasms that I've had, it was just very, very gentle. And if you were really hot to trot and focused on uh, getting it on or doing a lot of sexual activity, you might not even notice it. But where I have begun to notice it, and as I speak to more uh, women who have gone through the birth process, and especially like when a natural type of birth process, I had warm water, that, because I, I begin to observe this in some films, that when that uh, infant, newly born infant, is placed on the mother's chest, there's an energetic phenomenon that takes place. I'm able to read some energy patterns. I begin to see that it's a, it's a very subtle uh, and yummy energy, like a nectar. Uh, and I've heard this from a few women now. I have, I've explained it and they say, oh yes, there's so much love and you had the you know, birth process of you know, a few hours to 24, 48 hours, you know, you go through this physical ordeal. You know, it seems pretty minor, but what is literally is happening is that there is a, a manifesting of elemental energy. There's more energy coming in at that moment. So this type of, uh, of orgasm seems to be very, very subtle, and people may have experienced it in different times in their life, but they might call it love, romance. They want, unless you're a real subtle uh, meditator, a uh, meditator and real aware of some energy, you might miss it entirely and think of it something else. But it sure is yummy. It's the fourth type of orgasm, what I would call resonating body orgasm, what I used to call soul body orgasm. And I first began to hear about this. Uh, some people are into tantra and sexuality. They'd be walking down the, the beach and suddenly begin to feel this energy come over them and they begin to feel like no separation energetically between them and the sand and the, and the water. And it just felt like they were just, it was all a part of it. Uh, as I began to look at some patterns, I said, oh, that's a soul body orgasm. Well, that can happen for people who are not in a sexual context. And another example is, uh, and this is a video of Mitchell, an uh, astronaut, coming back towards Earth. He takes a look at the Earth from the shuttle again, and he has his very powerful experiences, which he called samadhi. But when he described it, and I was reading, listening, listening to his description and reading his energy patterns as he was describing it, he had what I call a soul body orgasm. 
Uh, and it, it's, it's like an energetic experience that feels profound. It is a oneness, which all mystical traditions talk about. This type of an orgasm is the one that we get the most energy from, but they don't happen very often. You can sit there and, you know, and tickle someplace in your body and make it happen. It's, I don't know what causes that for people. Some people just have it spontaneously. People have it once or twice in their life, the way they described it. But the point is, is that a lot of mystical spiritual experiences that people describe uh, are, are, are manifesting more elemental energy, bringing in more energy from within us. These are the, the four types of orgasm. But it all started for me looking at orgasm from an energetic point of view, finding a pattern and finding that pattern in other situations that look like sexuality or did not look like sexuality. Mm -hmm. And orgasm is more available to us than most people think, but because we have this unfortunate separation in our minds between what is uh, sexual and what is spiritual, which is just a real cultural limitation, sexuality is such a great teacher to pay attention to energy if we don't get caught up in our desire to please or be pleased. Um, uh, and... Uh, are going for the big O, feeling deep in the energy, feeling the sensations, uh, or as um, one Tibetan Lama study with, he called it the feeling tones. And it's like the vibrational uh, feeling tones. There's so much teaching in that, even though we may not understand it. Energetic development is not about understanding. So many spiritual traditions are about trying to understand this great philosophy or, or the teaches dogma. And that ain't it ain't it at all well i want to thank you so much for explaining all this to me and my listeners it's definitely uh something to consider because it is so complex and so simple at the same time so thank you so very much and everybody who's listening you can check out ray's website sexualshaman.com kenneth ray stubbs i know you prefer to be called ray i want to thank you again very much so that's why we always scream, oh God, we're having a spiritual experience. Thanks, Ray. And thanks for listening, y'all. Please join me at lisalandry.com. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Sign up for my newsletter. You'll get a free audio download. Shout out, Ari. I love you. Um, you might want to not listen to this podcast to your little older son.